All right, and one of the reasons why we read the entire chapter is because I think it's very important to get the context of what we are reading, especially when we're going to focus in on maybe one or two verses. It's important to know what is everything being said, so that way we know nothing's going to be stripped out of context. Now, the context of this chapter, and, and really the epistles of First and Second Corinthians, the, the churches at, at Corinth that Paul was writing to had a lot of problems. The church had, had all kinds of issues that were going on. And if you, if you gathered the tone of even this chapter, it's not unique just to this chapter. There's a lot of rebuke that's going on from the Apostle Paul to these churches because they have all these various issues. And one of the things that he brings up in this chapter, which is going to be the, the subject matter for the sermon this morning, is he's, he's warning and talking about people who come preaching another Jesus. False prophets, false brethren that come in and try to destroy. And what we need to understand, and I think a lot of Christians don't really get this, and it's probably because they're not really in the fight, is that there is a spiritual warfare going on. There's a spiritual battle that is going on on a regular basis. Satan is real. His devils are real. There are people that are that are children of darkness that are trying to spread that agenda, an anti-Christ, an anti-God agenda. And we as believers need to be on the front, on the front lines, pushing back against the wickedness and against the evil that is happening. And, and just the, you know, from the teaching to the, to the just wickedness and the tolerance of sin that's being promoted these days, it is disgusting. But what I'm going to be focusing on is this, this concept of the false preachers and the false prophets. And we're going to look a little bit into who Satan is and what he's about and, so that we won't be deceived because these people come in and they preach. So verse number four says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached... Or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So he's saying if someone comes in and they're preaching another Jesus or another spirit or another gospel, you might go along with them. They're saying you know, we need to watch out for that because there are people who preach another Jesus. The, the, most, um, the most common, I think the most easy to identify are those that preach that Jesus Christ was just a man, that he's not God in the flesh, that he's not a deed. That's another Jesus. The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness that don't believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, that, that he is the, not only the Son of God, but God himself. That is another Jesus. A Jesus that is simply a human being, that is just a mere mortal man, is another Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible who is the, the Savior, God in the flesh. That's the easiest one to discern. And then, of course, there's plenty of people preaching another gospel these days. People will say, oh yeah, they've got the right Jesus, but they're saying that, no, 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 you need to go to church or you need to work. You need to obey the commandments of the law in order to be saved. Believing's not enough. You need to be baptized. Believing's not enough. You need to give up all of your sins. Believing's not enough. When the Bible says that whosoever believeth shall be saved. So there's, there's this warning being given early on. Jump down to... Jump down to verse number... 12. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. So I'm going to go into this in just a little bit more, but just so you understand the, the terminology there, you say that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. Those are the people are looking for an occasion, for, for something to um, blame Paul with, to, to, to bring him down. They're, they're seeking something to, to tear Paul down with, to attack him. So they're looking up for some type of an occasion against him. And what he's saying is, 
you know, that I may cut off that opportunity. I'm going to cut off occasion from those that are seeking occasion against me. So he's walking uprightly. He's working very hard in order to make sure that he is above reproach, that people don't have any opportunity to, to tear his name down, even when they're lying, because everything he's doing is up front and above board, and there's, there's, there's no opportunity being given at all for someone to even lie about him as much as is possible. That's what he's trying to do here. But now he goes on to describe, he says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now keep your place here because I want to go back to a couple more verses in 2 Corinthians 11. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. He's likening these false apostles, the false prophets, these false teachers, these deceivers that are out to trick people. He's likening them to Satan. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking up some references to Satan to understand a little bit about who he is because, again, in, in the world today, if you're not reading your Bible, when people talk or think about Satan, I think the, probably the most common image that might come up in people's minds is a red guy with horns or a black guy with horns and a pitchfork, you know, poking people and, and standing at, at a fiery place or something like he's, he's the king of hell or something. And that's just not the truth at all. That is not who Satan is. Now, if you saw someone that was black with horns and wings and, 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 and looking at poking people with a pitchfork, you'd probably be like, yeah, I'm going to stay away from that guy. I'm not going to listen to anything he has to say, right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. That would be very overt into just saying like, yeah. I mean, if you saw anybody dressed like that, you'd be like, okay, this guy's a weirdo. I'm not, <laughs> not going to have anything to do with him. Satan is way more subtle than that, and that is not how he appears at all. And this is why it's so important to understand who Satan is because he's going to try to appear to you as a really good person, a really good guy, someone who's maybe just a little bit misunderstood. This is who Satan is. We're going to see some description of what the Bible gives us of who Satan is. I referenced Ezekiel 28 last week, and you'll notice here it's talking to, it's, it's preaching to the king of Tyre, Tyrus is what it says in Ezekiel 28. You can see there in the first couple verses, it says, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am, excuse me, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, there is no secret that they can hide from thee. And it goes on and on. We're going to jump ahead a little bit in this chapter. But, but the point I was trying to make, and I, and I brought this up last week, is that especially in Ezekiel and in other books of the Bible, there's um, preaching against different kings and different kingdoms, different places of God's judgment coming. And what we see here is, yes, there's a message being given to the king or the prince of Tyre, of Tyrus, but this is also referring to the spiritual wickedness in high places that is behind the king, the one who's actually kind of swaying the king and influencing the king, the, the physical king, the, the, the man, the king of Tyre. But behind that is Satan. We're going to see that here in verse number 12, that it's going to be clearly referring to Satan and not referring to just the man that's the king. Verse number 12 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So take note of that, perfect in beauty. Verse 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, right away, we know that after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, that the Garden of Eden was sealed and there's angels guarding it and you know, no one's gone into the Garden of Eden since then. This is obviously not talking about the physical king of Tyre anymore that is ruling at, that, at the time that Ezekiel is preaching you know, to give this message to. This is referring to Satan. It says, 
Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So we're, as we read further, you're going to see even more clearly that this is talking about Satan. But what we're looking at, we're getting a picture of here, is a creature who is perfect in beauty. Very, very beautiful. Not only beautiful, it's talking about all these beautiful stones, diamonds, onyx, you know, this, this covering that's just or, or, or ornamented or, you know, um, dressed up in just in beauty. And it says the workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes. So it's talking about the, Satan's voice being very pleasant, musical, something that's going to be appealing to hear, not only just to look upon, but to hear. There are going to be things that, that are going to appeal to people. Look at verse number 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay, now we're talking about an angel, a cherub. That's one of God's creations. That's what Satan is. He's an anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So Satan was this, was this anointed cherub, very beautiful creature, very musical voice, great to look on, and was perfect until iniquity was found in him. Verse number 17 Thine heart, oh wait, verse number 16, excuse me. By the, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So what happened with Satan, Satan's downfall was his pride. He looked at how God created him. He looked at how beautiful he was and how magnificent he was and how bright and shining he was and thought, wow, I'm so great. Instead of giving God the glory and the praise and the honor for making him that way, he was just like, well, look at me, how how." great and wonderful I am and allowed himself to to be lifted up in himself and iniquity iniquity is found in him and it says um, that he's corrupted his wisdom so he was a very intelligent creature as well God created him very smart but his own wisdom was corrupted because he basically you blind yourself when you get when you get full of yourself you get blind and become a fool because anyone that thinks too highly of themselves is a fool. Because you're looking past your own flaws, your own faults, and you're looking past God. When you start thinking like this, when you're starting to think, well, I'm God. Because that's that's, that was Satan's mindset. And we saw that from the beginning of chapter 28 also, that he's lifted himself up as God. Verse number 18, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So obviously God's going to take care of Satan at some point. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. So a little bit to the left, if you're in Ezekiel, you go backwards to Isaiah chapter 14. Well, what I really wanted to take away from that passage is just how, like the appearance of Satan. That he looks beautiful, he sounds beautiful. Sarah, sit up in your seat and turn around and pay attention and stop playing. Satan does not look like what most people would project Satan to look like today. He's going to look like someone that's beautiful. He's going to sound appealing. Isaiah 14, we're going to get a little bit more information on Satan as well here. And this is, by the way, this is only found in the King James Bible, the name Lucifer. If you've ever heard of Lucifer and you know that Lucifer is talking about Satan, it's because it came from this Bible. The other, the other books, 
especially like the NIV and there's, there's other modern translations that the, will call this the, the, bright mor the, the morning star, which Jesus is referred to as the morning star in the book of Revelation. But um, this, is, this is translated correctly here as Lucifer. We're going to start reading in verse number four. And that word Lucifer, it literally means a light bearer, a bringer of light. If you're familiar with, um, if you know Spanish at all, the, you know the word la luz, luz is light. Uh, it's a, that's the root word. That's a Latin root word of, of light. And there was even a, a, a city in the Bible that was named Luz or Luz. That's, it means light. So Lucifer comes from that root, root word of Luz, which it means light. So he's a light bringer. He's a light bearer. And honestly, this is how, um, not to get too far off on a tangent, but the, the Mormon church, maybe you might not realize this, they, they don't look at Satan as like a real bad guy. It's a very Luciferian religion. Satan was just, he was actually, in, in the Mormon religion, and I know this is completely not related to what we're, we're talking about this morning, but I just want to make sure you understand this. The Mormons believe that Jesus and Satan were brothers. Like, like literal spirit brothers. And that the plan for earth, they both came up with a plan on salvation, and Lucifer's plan was, well, let's just have everybody be saved. Let's just basically force them all to be saved, and then they'll all be with the Father. And Jesus said, no, let's give them free will and allow them to make the choice. And, you know, Jesus' plan was chosen, and I know it sounds silly, but Jesus' plan was chosen over Satan's plan. And Jesus became the savior of the world. And that's, that's how the gods decided it in the Mormon religion. And they view Lucifer of what in, the, in the garden when he was tempting Eve with the forbidden fruit as a good thing in bringing them knowledge. And that's what the Luciferian religions of the world and the Satanists will tell you is that he's just misunderstood. He's bringing knowledge. Isn't knowledge a good thing? Is knowledge a good thing? Yeah, knowledge is a good thing. But not when you're disobeying God, not when you're contradicting and, and, and breaking one of his, you know, his commands and completely just sinning against God. No, then it's not a good thing. But they look at it saying, well, see, he's just giving them information. He's giving them knowledge. He's actually the good guy. Some people go as far as to say that, that God, the Lord, is the bad one or the evil one, and Lucifer is actually the good one. And it's, that's obviously total nonsense, but some people believe that out there. Some people, are very, and, and, and Mormonism has, it's a spinoff of that. It's, they have, it's, it's very wicked. It's very wicked. And I know there's been this push in the past decade for, for people to just become more and more accepting of, oh, well, Mormon is just another Christian religion. No, it's not. It's a cult. It was started by a, by a cult leader, Joseph Smith, who was a pervert polygamist that had wives as young as like 13 or 12. I don't want to get the, the exact number wrong, but he had, he had little children as, as wives. And then Brigham Young, and you could go through the whole history of that. It's not that hard to show that that, that is, a, is a really wicked cult. And you know, up until recently now, we had you know, Mitt Romney running for president, and Christians aren't even batting an eye that the guy is, is, a, is a cult member. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. You're going to fall for that. You want someone like that leading our country? I'm That's old news. Let's get back, let's get back into, uh, into the subject matter now. Sorry for the, for the departure from the main point here. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to start reading here in verse number 4. Verse number four, the Bible says that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. So now you notice we saw in Ezekiel 28, it was the king of Tyrus. Now, now there's preaching against the king of Babylon, but it's still the same spiritual leader in both because Satan will move around to different areas and, and provide his influence over these kings of the world. Thou, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. 
Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave in the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. So again, now we're seeing the pomp, the pride, and the noise of thy vials. A vial is like a, is a musical instrument. Verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Lucifer is out there weakening the nations. He's trying to destroy. He's, he's trying to bring in this wickedness. He's doing everything against God that he possibly can, and he's doing it subtly as he did it in the garden. The subtle serpent that deceived Eve that, that wouldn't at first just come right out with a flat-out lie. He just starts questioning. Starts adding these questions, add doubt to God's word, questioning God's word, and then trying to present something sinful as something good. This is the way Satan operates, and he's going to come to you looking pleasant. He's going to come speaking things that might sound good to the ears, but what's behind it is destruction. Let's keep reading here, verse number 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? that open not the house of his prisoners. Turn back, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 11. Open we got a bookmarker there. Both of these places in Ezekiel and Isaiah are, are, are giving a description of Satan. And it's, it's important to understand a little bit more about this because the false prophets are being likened unto Satan. So they're saying in the same way that Satan has this this glorious outward appearance that, that he is able to speak things that could sound real nice because of the way that his, that his vocal cords were created. We ought to be, now, and, and I believe this, even though he is that way, even though he appears that way, you know, we have become conditioned and we ought to be conditioned to know that, no, Satan is actually evil. Satan is wrong because in the flesh, when something, when someone comes to you looking pretty, looking nice, you know, sounding good, the normal reaction is going to be to receive that and to accept that and, and not give it a second thought. That's why we need to be conditioned to be like, well, no, Satan is actually bad because we know what the end of it is. We know what his goal is. We know how subtle and conniving and deceiving he is that we, he's actually an enemy, and we need to be on guard against that and be able to protect ourselves against the wiles of the devil, against the things that, that, he is, um, that he is trying to do to hinder us and to try to get us into sin. Likewise, we can't be naive about his followers and the false prophets. It's... The problem that most believers have is that it's hard to fathom the wicked mind, the extremely wicked mind of people who you see it all throughout the book of Proverbs and in many other places, and you see in the book of Psalms, people who are actually set on destruction. People who actually want to destroy. People who in their heart are looking, are, they're setting traps. They're looking to harm other people. That is hard to comprehend for the normal person. 
Because most people don't have it in their heart to go out and just hurt and destroy and do all of this stuff. That it, it, it's a foreign concept, so much so that we have a tendency to think that who could ever possibly be like that? Now, it is not a majority of people out there that are like that, of course. But we need to, to remind ourselves regularly that these people exist. Abigail, stop doing that. Pay attention. We need to remind ourselves that these people exist because they're very dangerous. The same way that, that it probably you can't fathom how can, a, how can a person, you know, defile a child? How could that even happen? I mean, it boggles the mind. Who, who in the world could ever get to the point where they could do something like that? But they exist. They're out there. They're predators. They prey on children. They prey on weak and they are literally look for the opportunity to do something evil and wicked. And because they exist, we need to be aware of that. In like manner, there are people out there, there are preachers out there that are going to get up and they're going to dress real nice. They're going to put on the topaz and the carbuncle and the onyx and the gold. And they're going to look real nice. And they're going to open up their mouth. And it's going to sound like a tabret. They may be very smooth talkers. But just as much as we need to watch out for the predators, just as much as we need to watch out for Satan, we need to watch out for the wicked false prophets that bring another Jesus, that bring another gospel, because they're going to be damning souls to hell with their lies and with their deceits. And there are people out there, they're called the wolves in sheep's clothing, the Bible talks quite a bit about them. That on the outward appearance, they're going to look great, but inwardly, they're ravening wolves looking to destroy. And they exist. So we need to make sure that we are smart enough, that we have enough knowledge, that we know God's word enough to not be deceived when the person that comes along can sound pretty good. We need to be able to compare what anybody says against God's word. And, I, and if you never come back to this church, you go to other churches, always keep that in mind because the responsibility ultimately is yours. And I encourage everyone to question everything that I say. Don't just accept what I say blindly. Don't ever do that. That's going to lead you into trouble. Now, obviously, I'm not up here trying to deceive you. I mean, I know my own heart. You don't necessarily know my heart. You need to guard yourself and you need to get in the word and you need to be able to, to receive from this. And if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is going to lead you into all truth. There is nothing, there is nothing that you need to receive from a person that you can't learn through your own Bible reading in the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm not saying it's not important to come to church. I'm not saying it's not important to learn from someone else who's already studied. Obviously, God has given the, the office of a bishop or a deacon and, and a pastor, you know, to, to provide, to give teaching, to help, to help the church along, to, to watch over the church, to do all kinds of different things. It's very important. And you can learn a lot from a teacher. But at the end of the day, you need to decide what you believe and it has to match up with Scripture. That's... That's the way that, that you have to deal with that. And we need to be aware because there are a lot of deceivers out there. So back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, But what I do that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. So these workers of Satan, these, these false prophets, were looking to try to destroy the work of the Apostle Paul. Why? Because they're antichrist. Because Paul was doing a good work for Christ. He was leading a lot of people to Christ. He was giving truth and he was going through and, and, and evangelizing, you know, he's trying to evangelize the whole world. He was doing a great work for God. So the workers for Satan are trying to stop him. So what are they doing? They're looking for anything that they could use against him. They're looking for any occasion of stumbling. They're looking for anything that they could bring up to try to destroy the person. That is the agenda. And then he describes them in verse number 13. He says, For such are false apostles, 
deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So the greatest deceiver is not going to come to you looking like a deceiver, looking like someone who's going to fool you, looking like the thug on the street that's got, you know, strapped with a pistol that's going to try to extort money out of you. They're not the best con men because you can spot them a mile away. The best con men are the ones that are going to come in. They're going to say a lot of religious things. They're going to quote the Bible to you. They're going to come in and try to gain your confidence, but they're going to twist it. They're going to twist it just a little bit, just enough to have it be a lie, to be deceitful. Think about the best fake money that's out there, the counterfeiters. They don't come in with monopoly looking money trying to pass that off as a real bill. They study and look at the real thing and they try to make their fake money as close as possible as the real thing. But it, guess what? It's not real. It holds no value. It's a forgery. It's a counterfeit. It's a fake. But the best ones are trying to get as close as possible. So we need to be aware that the, the best false prophets, you know, it's kind of an oxymoron, but the, the, the people who are as, at the best at their job of deceiving are going to be the ones that are going to try to look as close as possible to the truth with it still being twisted and being a lie. That is what needs to be understood about this. Judas is a great example of this, the traitor the disciple that betrayed Jesus Christ, he looked like all the other apostles in so much that he deceived everybody. Now, we know, we have the benefit of knowing because we read back on these things and we have all the information presented together, but just put yourself back in their situation. Judas is going out with Jesus, traveling around with Jesus, ministering with Jesus. And the whole time, he's an infiltrator. The whole time. Jesus Christ said, said, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? He knew who the devil was because Jesus, Jesus is God in the flesh. I mean, Jesus knew that Judas was a traitor and he knew that he had to be there. He knew that everything had to be fulfilled. But no one else knew it. When he brought up the fact that there was a traitor among them, they all questioned themselves. None of the apostles said, is it Judas? They said, is it me? Why? Because they trusted everybody else so much. They thought they knew everybody else so much that they couldn't question anyone else, but just like, well, is it me? I mean, it can't be Judas. It can't be Peter. It can't be John. It can't, you know, is it me? That's how well Judas slipped in under the radar. And the Bible teaches us that it's not just him, that it's going to happen. It will happen. And we need to be aware of it. Now, that doesn't mean that we're on a hair trigger to go on a witch hunt to find out who's a Judas in here, right? And we're going to look around and just, and just be like, you know, trying to uncover everything. About, no, we, the, the way that we deal with people is you, you give people the benefit of the doubt, right? We're humble. We will, will, will you know, um, receive people. Based on the things that you say, you say, you say you're a believer, you say, you know, great. But the level of trust that you put in someone needs to be monitored. I mean, at the end of the day, the only person that we could trust is God. Man will fail. The Bible says, yea, let every man be a liar, but, you know, but God is true. Um, let God be true, but every man a liar is what the Bible says. Even, a, you know, a pastor, you can't just put all of your faith in a pastor to just never fail you, to always be there, because if you're trusting in a man, a man's going to let you down. Now, we love each other, we love each other as brethren, but we always need to remember that, you know, and, and it, it, what I'm trying to explain, this is one of the reasons why, you know, we don't let, I don't let my children go off with anyone else other than very, very, very close family that I know that, like, that I was raised with, that I know personally. Um, it, it's very, very limited the number of people that we will allow in the trust of our children. And if you think of how, much, how valuable a child is, 
to a parent. It would be devastating to learn that anything happened to your child because you let them be in the trust of somebody that wasn't deserving of your trust. So we love people, but I'm never going to allow my children to just go and, and you know, stay with someone else because we don't know. And, and that's too much of a risk for me to take. So I guess what I'm saying is that you have to balance out knowing that there are people out there that are out set to destroy what your risk level is. Now, a person that I'm not going to let my children stay with, I'll give them a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever if they need money or something. You know, if they end up being a thief, so be it, right? That's just money. But there are certain things that are really valuable that, that I just say no way with. Now, we see here in verse 13 that we already read this for such are false prophets deceitful workers transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ they're going to come and they're not going to play themselves off as Satanists they're going to look like apostles of Christ just like Judas did jump down to verse number 15 there it says therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works many people don't understand why some pastors can be so hard on false prophets. And, and I'll name some, I don't mind naming them either because they need to be marked and avoided. They need to be identified according to the Bible. We see the Apostle Paul marking and avoiding people. He talks about Hymenaeus. He talks about Philetus. He talks about Alexander the coppersmith. He talks about these people that, he, he, you know, they are workers of, the, of Satan. They are workers of the devil. They are preaching another Jesus. They're preaching a false gospel. And I know this, this, this won't go over very well in America today, but just recently we learned of the death of Billy Graham, right? He's known as America's pastor. Billy Graham was a Baptist, right? Supposedly, in name, he was a Baptist. He was a Baptist church. Billy Graham was a false prophet. Billy Graham says that there are people in the, in the unbelieving world, in Islam, and he, in all these other religions that he believes are sincere and he believes are going to be in heaven because they're following the light that they have. That's what Billy Graham said on the Hour of Power, or whatever TV show that was. He also reiterated almost the same exact thing when he was talking to Larry King in an interview. Oh, I don't say people who don't believe in Jesus are going to hell. Anybody that says stuff like that, they're, they're a false prophet. It's not true. And you know, Jesus, you know what Jesus Christ said? He said, Woe unto you when all men, when all men shall speak well of you. For so did they to the false prophets. In Matthew chapter 5, I don't have this in my notes. Oh, he doesn't go into it in Matthew 5. In Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, he says, blessed, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And there's, an, there's another passage, and I don't have the, the reference memorized, where, um, where he basically says, not only that statement, but also the opposite. So he's saying that, hey, you're blessed when people are persecuting you. You're blessed because you're in good company. Because think about it. Jesus Christ, was he widely just accepted by everybody? No, he was persecuted and arrested and lied about and killed. He was martyred. Look back at Jeremiah. Look back at Ezekiel. Look back at these great prophets and what happened to them. They were all being persecuted. None of them were just being widely accepted. Look at Elijah. Elijah thought he was all alone in his belief. That wicked Jezebel was going out to kill him. He was on the run. This is how God's prophets are known in the Bible is through persecution. Jesus said, woe unto you, when all men speak well of you, for so did they to the about the false prophets. The false prophets, they get all of the praise. They get all of the glory and the respect from the world. 
The Bible says that the, that the things of the world are not of the Father. And if, if you are loved by the world, if you could go into any church, if you could go into any any engagement, if you can just be received at the presidential inauguration is just, you are this great man of God and everybody in the whole country is just, is just loving that, there's a problem. Because a real prophet is not going to be received and loved by the world. It would be one thing if the vast majority of people in a country were believers but that's not the case, and I don't think that's ever been the case. If you're loved by the world, you're not loved by God. It's the bottom line. Because that means you're of the world and not of God. Another example is, is Joel Osteen. And I don't see how people can't see through the facade of that guy. I, I was talking last week with someone. Even when I was unsaved, you look at guys like that and it's like, how could you not see their total scam? There's a scam artist. They're all about the money. They're all about just getting more and more money. And these people on the, on the TV, you know, these televangelists that are, you know, send in, send in your $100 and it's going to come back $1,000. You send in this. And, and, and it's all about the money. And that's what they care about. And they, and they lie through their teeth. They never say anything negative. It's all how great everything is and how good this is and how great life is. And, you know, don't worry about sin. Everything's just fine and will just say whatever they can say like a politician to just make people happy with them. When that's not preaching the Bible. You know, the Bible is, it says what it says. We don't pick and choose. We don't censor God's word. At least we're not supposed to. We need to watch out for the false prophets. Many people don't understand why some pastors can be so hard on the false prophets. And it's usually because they don't quite see that person that they actually are a false prophet. They look at people as just maybe being a little confused and the pastor's overreacting. Oh, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really know. Oh, you just don't understand. It's a little bit different. They do, they're just a little bit different believing. You know, and I can't say that never happens that someone might overreact. But I've noticed this, and I've noticed this even with myself, and I've noticed this with other people, especially in newer believers, that are, that are either just new to the faith altogether, new to going to church, don't have the proper perspective or discernment on false prophets. I know when I, I've mentioned this before, but I know when I got saved, I had this feeling that like, hey, I just joined this club of like all of these other Christians and like there's all these other people that are saved out there because I didn't know any better. I didn't know that much about what all these different, you know, all these different denominations and all these different churches believe. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you have to be a Baptist in order to be saved, but there are so many groups of people that call themselves Christians that believe false gospels. And while you can say, oh yeah, there's this much percentage of Christians in a particular area, it's not really accurate because people call themselves Christians, but that doesn't mean that they're believing the right gospel. There are a lot of people that believe it. There's, I mean, there's whole segments and denominations of people that have false gospels, like the Catholic Church has a works-based salvation. The Pentecostals believe you could lose your salvation, which is a reliance on the law and not on Jesus Christ. If he, gave, he either gave us eternal life or he didn't. There's so many segments of people that just have it wrong. Now, it doesn't mean they're not sincere, but they've got it wrong. And I'm not saying that everyone who adheres to a false religion is a false prophet. There's a big difference there and a big distinction. I don't want you to miss that because everybody's going to have something wrong. Nobody has everything perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. But there's a difference between someone who is deceived and someone who is a deceiver. The deceived people have been deceived by deceivers. That's what makes the deceiver so bad. Because they're the ones going out and, and spreading the lies and recruiting people into this false, uh, false religion. The deceived are just deceived. We love the deceived. We're trying to reach him. We're trying to reach him with the truth. The deceivers, on the other hand, the workers of Satan, they're the enemy. But oftentimes when people are a little bit newer... Maybe people who are, who are newer to kind of just getting on fire and getting in their Bible 
and, and newer to being even sold out. Even people have been soul winning and reading their Bible, I would say every day for five years, are still somewhat newer in being able to discern the false prophets because they can be so subtle and so sneaky. And when you've been around for a longer time, it becomes easier to spot the attributes of the wolf early on because they come in she dressed like in sheep's clothing. But all it takes is for the pastor, for someone who's well-learned, to see one of those fangs, to know that's a wolf. Now, what I'm, what I'm trying to express here is that when you know someone is, is, has been around for a long time and has seen a lot in churches, you know, a, a very tenured or experienced pastor, someone who knows the Bible really well, I'm not saying that they're perfect because nobody is. But when a false prophet is called out, don't be quick to just dismiss that too easily, especially if you're very new in the faith. Because when that guy sees the fang, he knows it's a wolf. And what happens oftentimes with newer believers is that they'll see the fang too, but they'll be like, oh, that sharpie pointed tooth, they just need some braces. They just need a little work on that fang. They're not really a wolf. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, sheep don't have fangs at all. But oftentimes, people who are newer to the faith just, just kind of look at it through a different lens, and they'll say, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually, they're not, that doesn't make them a wolf. When someone who's experienced and learned it could just see one, one surefire th way to tell, like, yeah, that's a wolf. I could tell. I've seen the fangs before. That's a wolf fang. That is not a misshapen sheep tooth. This is a wolf, and I'm going to call them out as such. So, but I will say this, that the wolf always ends up showing their true colors. It's just a matter of time. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 27. Because I want you to see this. That we ought not be having sympathy for the wolf either. Just as much as, I mean, does, is anyone here sympathetic to Satan? Are you just sympathetic? Oh, he's just misunderstood. You don't understand. No, he's wicked. He's the devil, right? I mean, the thing that you, that you want to rail against the most, the devil. The perpetrator of all evil. We don't have sympathy for Satan because we know he destroys. We know he's bad and wicked to the bone. There's no sympathy for that. But we don't have sympathy for the wolf either, even though they may do things that might try to gain your sympathy. Matthew chapter 27, we're going to see what happened with Judas. Judas is not someone that you need to have sympathy for. Judas was a devil. Judas knew what he was doing. Judas was a deceiver. Judas was a traitor. Judas was not a, a, a good guy. He was not just misunderstood. He was wicked. He was a thief. And he was a traitor to Jesus Christ. And he was the one who led the people to bring Jesus to his death. But even the wolf can show signs of being sad. And because oftentimes Christians can be very compassionate with people, you might want to feel sorry for the wolf, but don't feel sorry for the wolf. You feel sorry for everybody else. Feel sorry for those that were deceived. Don't feel bad for the wolf when he's caught or when he's destroyed. Matthew 27, look at verse number three. The Bible says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. He felt bad about what he did. So much so that he went and killed himself. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't a wicked devil. Because he was. And oftentimes you'll see the wicked wolves and devils shedding tears and looking sorrowful and trying to gain your sympathy and trying to gain your emotions to again just deceive you that much more. But here's why I'm saying this. You can say, yeah, but look at this. He repented himself and, and he brought the money again. He didn't want anything to do with it and he realized what he did was wrong. 
Psalm 109 gives us God's perspective of Judas, even after these things. I'll read it for you. You can turn if you'd like. I'll read it for you. Psalm 109, verse 7 says, When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Now, the reason why we know it's talking about Judas is because he says, it says here, let another take his office. And this is quoted in Acts chapter 1 when they're replacing Judas with Matthias. When, when they're choosing a new apostle to, to take the place of Judas's place. He says, let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. That's a curse. That is not feeling sorry. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. And you could go on and on and on and read the continual curses in Psalm 109. That's talking about Judas. And that's from God. That's the Holy Spirit's perspective. The author of the Bible. The author of God's word. That's not man's perspective. That's not David's perspective. This is prophecy. He didn't know Judas, but this is the judgment against him, even though he felt sorry, even though he cried, even though he hung himself because he felt so bad about it. We don't need to have the sympathy for the wolf. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. It's the last place I'll have you turn this morning. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're almost done. You need to understand that a pastor is ordained to watch over the flock. I'm going to read Hebrews 13, 17 while you're turning to 2 Peter 2. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. The pastor's job is to watch for your soul. And you know, again, granted, pastors are just men and not to be idolized. However, if you have a good pastor, they ought to know more Bible than you do. They ought to be more experienced. That, that's part of the, the reasons why you have a pastor is because this is someone who's experienced. This is someone who knows God's word really well. This is someone who's going to be diligent in looking out for the flock. They ought to be laboring in the word. They ought to be good under shepherds in order to spot the wolves. So be careful with how critical you are of the pastors or the the. the these under shepherds that are looking out for the flock and identifying the wolves. Because that's part of the job. And in 2 Peter 2, this whole chapter is dedicated to false prophets. And we're going to see the characteristics of the false prophets and why they are to be dealt with very harshly and not given sympathy. Because of who they are. Just like Satan, they may look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, they are full of wickedness and sin and deceit and guile and just all manner of evil. Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people. Get this, even as there shall be false teachers among you. They're going to be there. That's a promise who privily, that means secretly or privately, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. This is the tactic. They want to get in subtly. They want to creep into churches. They want to get in privately and then start teaching heresy, start teaching and twisting and saying, yeah, you know, well, have you thought about this? And, and just start really going off into severe heresy to where even denying the Lord that bought them. Watch out for that. The best way to watch out is, is knowing what the Bible says for yourself. Verse number two, then you won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men who lie in wait with their cunning craftiness to deceive the simple. Verse number two, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Another, another damage point that the wolf does or the false prophet does when they creep in is that because of their pernicious ways, they end up bringing the whole, you know, the, the way of truth to be evil spoken of. 
So let's say you have a great church that's preaching great things and doing a great work for God. And then someone infiltrates and sneaks in and then does all kinds of wicked things and bad things and becomes ousted. Now, all of a sudden, it brings down the whole name of the church of the actual the way of truth that they were they were giving has now been tarnished and brought down and brought low because of the actions of this one person who came in to destroy. I mean, think about it. Entire churches could be destroyed off of the accusations or the actions of one person within the church. It happens all the time. Someone gets defiled, something horrible happens. It doesn't mean that everybody in that church was wicked and doing bad things. They could have been doing really good things, but because that one crept in, it damages and destroys all the good. And that's the purpose. That's the goal. That's why the predators sneak in, because they want to destroy the whole thing. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words, or fake words, they say things that they don't really mean, in order to make merchandise of you. They view you as a way to get money. They make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. In a parallel passage in Jude, um, the book of Jude and 2 Peter 2 are, are, are talking about the same things, are very parallel passages. Stay in 2 Peter 2. We're going to jump down to verse 12. In Jude verse 16, the Bible says, These are murmurers, complainers, having, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They lift people up, men's, the persons of men in admiration. Why? Just so that they could be advantaged just to benefit themselves. This is, these are the ways that they operate. They're very proud. They're, they speak lies. They, they feign their words just to make money off of people. Verse number 12, but these as natural brute beasts, that means dumb animals, made to be taken and destroyed, that's how we ought to be thinking about them. The false prophets are dumb animals that are made to be taken and destroyed. That is the attitude that needs to be it's given towards the false prophets and not this one of compassion. Speak evil of the things that they understand not. Why can't they understand the Bible? Because they're not saved. Because they're false teachers. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you. He's warning, again, he continues to bring it up that these people will be with you. They'll be at your feasts. They'll be at your potluck dinners. They'll be right there with you trying to bring in their damnable heresies and their influence and, and predators. Um, predators right here, look at verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery. This is, this, these are the false prophets, these people that sneak in the churches. On the outward, they look like they're a normal person and they're saying things and you're talking to them. But inside, their eyes are full of adultery. They're looking at people just, just with, I mean, how weird and wicked and sinful is that just to be going to church and just having your eyes full of adultery. But that's what these people are like. That, they, they cannot cease from sin. That's what it says in the next phrase there, verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery, they cannot cease from sin. You know, we're all sinful. We all may have sinful thoughts from time to time. But you know what? If you're saved, you could stop from sinning for a while. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're ever going to be completely perfect. But these people cannot stop sinning. I mean, it's just all the time for them. Beguiling unstable souls. That means deceiving or tricking someone who's unstable. They're not grounded in the truth. Those are the easier targets. Those are the people they're going to attack, people who they know, oh, this person doesn't know their Bible very well. Or going after children because children are very unstable. They're still being taught and trained. Beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. 
For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. There are many attributes given here in these chapters. And you could, you could read the whole chapter later, read the book of Jude. But there's many attributes to look out for in the wolf. Flattery is one of them. They're going to try to flatter people, use their mouth to sound, uh, to, to butter you up, to gain your confidence. They're covetous. They care about money. They care about just, just their own personal gain. They're thieves. They're liars. They'll say whatever they want. Their eyes are full of adultery. This is what the false prophet looks like on the inside. And the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The fangs show themselves. It's just a matter of time, but we need to be ready and, and careful just to, to be on the lookout for that because it will happen. Any good church, especially that's doing a good work for the Lord, is going to have an infiltrator. It's going to have someone that's going to try in and to destroy the work. As I mentioned before, it doesn't mean we're on a witch hunt to just, to just you know, be judging everybody for every little thing, but we do need to keep it in mind and prepare yourself and guard yourself that you're, you're prepared for that. I have one more verse here. I'll just quote it for you. 1 John 2.18 says, Little children, is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. So there's people that go out, these false teachers, they go out from maybe a good group of people, like here, the disciples. There were people that went out for them, from them, but they were not of them. It means that they really weren't a part of them, but they left from them, it says, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But these false prophets, they, they started off getting yoked up and grouped up with the disciples, and then they branched off and did their own thing because they didn't believe, because they were these false prophets. He says, if they would have, you know, they would have continued with us if they would have been of us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So they made themselves known that they really weren't one of us. Because they went out and, and started deceiving people and, and, and preaching their own lies instead of continuing in with the disciples' doctrine. And um, you know, hopefully that helps you. I want you to be able to identify these people because it can be tricky. We, we, we need to be able to balance our compassion for people with who we have compassion for. We, we don't need to have compassion for the person that's out trying to destroy and be wicked and, and destroy good churches and destroy the work of God. We need to be aware that these people exist and look for the warning signs. And I'll tell you what, when, when all men are speaking highly of someone, watch out for that guy. When everybody in the world loves them, when the whole world loves somebody, they're not of God. They're not. The whole world didn't love Jesus. The whole world is never going to love Jesus. The Bible says if the, that um, the love of... If, the love of the, whosoever loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But let's, let's keep these truths in mind and let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us all the, the instruction and warning from your word. Lord, I pray that you please help us to be able to identify the deceivers and the false prophets that are looking to destroy, dear Lord. We love you and we thank you for giving us the truth and the guidance and especially for Jesus Christ who paid for our sins, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.